here to uh, chat to you today about um, carbon, what carbon relevant to the world of wine and how also packaging is a good example there. Um, I invite you to um, ask questions or join the conversation on Twitter should you wish. I will uh, aim to respond when uh, off stage um, later. So yes, yeah, so the team um, this year at Back to Innovations is the big carbon debate and it should be the big carbon debate because actually over the last couple of years the conversation here has been about plastic and I'm pretty sure that by now certainly everyone working on the packaging ecosystem understands the complexities about this material but in my view it was too granular a conversation to be having um, as an industry uh, when there are bigger more macro issues to look at. And in fact, when I spoke here last year in Birmingham, I put forward the point that if um, it was continuing to be the big plastic debate, it should be uh, rebranded to be called packaging reactions rather than packaging innovations. Because in my view, there is no innovation when you're reacting, knee-jerk reacting, to a problem that was brought to the attention of the world thanks to the great Sir David Attenborough. But no, but, but fortunately, uh, this year, packaging innovations has moved on. We are now talking about the big carbon debate, and it is the most important conversation to be having. So it's great um, to, to be here and to be sharing our view on why the carbon debate is uh, so important. So, um, yeah, we're, we're at Pact Innovations uh, this year. Uh, I'm Santiago Navarro, co-founder and CEO of Garçon Wines. I'm um, pleased to be sharing our view on carbon in the wine industry and that's an important point I'll come back to because actually the carbon footprint of everything we're doing, of our industry, of the packaging industry and of any industry you may all work in is probably the most important thing you should be looking at because the IPCC makes it absolutely clear um, that this is a massive um, issue we have. Uh, the, the planet is heating at an accelerated rate we are in a position of um, uh, uh, significant uh, danger if not uh, looking at it. And um, it's important when we're talking about carbon to look a little bit um, into detail about um, carbon and um, the topic here and, and a lot of what people talk about is actually the measurements being taken at uh, Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Um, it's, a great, it's a great place to be um, measuring the carbon footprint in our atmosphere because you have this uh, uh, island with this volcano on it which creates a perfect ecosystem for measuring carbon. And the important point coming out of this observatory uh, is this measure that has been taken since the 1958. And as I'm sure you'll all agree here, there's a distinctive upward trend. Um, if we extend that further, and this is the point at which Mauna Loa comes into play, this is all ice core measurements, this is CO2, this is methane, I'll come back to it later. Um, you'll see that um, we are massively accelerating, we're accelerating at the point where the big carbon debate becomes the vitally important carbon debate becomes a debate that we should all be having because uh, business and, and commerce and such matters will become irrelevant when we start to exist in a world where we are uh, under an existential threat. And so if you see what's happened here over the years uh, up until the 1950s is the key contributors to our carbon footprint have been the developed com countries we know today. But move into the most recent 50 years, and it's actually the developing countries who are um, contributing most to the carbon footprint and who uh, should be part of that carbon debate as they are. And they argue that they have a right to um, put more carbon into the atmosphere to catch up on what happened here with the rest of us. But unfortunately, we're no longer in that at that point. So we talk about carbon as one of the greenhouse gas emissions and um, as you can see here it makes up uh, more than 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions that go into our atmosphere. And I know you must be wondering, I didn't sign up for a science lecture or, or a talk on that matter, but it's fundamentally important that we understand what's happening with the carbon in our world and why this becomes a major issue. And actually this is the picture of methane being released from, from uh, permafrost and a fundamentally important gas to monitor because as carbon heats up our planet 
their ice melts and as the ice melts the methane releases and it's got 25 times the uh, planet warming potential that carbon has and so then we start to enter even further points of acceleration. So yes, I think um, probably one of the most significant things to um, take away from my talk today is that we have entered a space where we are experiencing the highest levels of CO2 in our atmosphere for three million years. And um, this is Greta Thunberg tweeting the measurement last year, which was the highest measurement ever seen. Now, at that point, she raised the point that we had experienced the highest concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere in three million years. I think you'll all agree that three million years is a long time. Um, and this is more recent, so this is February the 11th from this year, where we hit 416. We've gone up by one part per million in our atmosphere. And once again, it's the highest ever daily average. And so this is um, our carbon footprint over the last 800,000 years. So um, pre that, it's harder to get accurate data. But what you can see here is over the last 800,000 years. And uh, rest assured, we all looked very different back then. We're uh, entering a space no pre-homo sapiens. Um, you, we stayed below 300, actually once we hit 300 here, um, uh, and, uh, but more recently we've accelerated way past 300. We've gone towards 4, 407 is this measurement in 2018, but as I explained before, this year we hit 416. And just to put things into perspective, at 450, 450, science shows us we enter into a position where we experience um, extreme weather events of biblical proportions. The world becomes seriously uninhabitable. Uh, countries and people go into warfare to find places where to exist. And it's very real. I know it seems a bit uh, unreal, but you're sitting in the comfort of the NEC, uh, enjoying a great life in the United Kingdom, to imagine that. But it's um, when we're talking about 800,000 years, 3 million years, and things can be extremely different to what we know. And so Sir David Attenborough makes this plea very clearly, and I'm not sure whether this will play, but... Right now, we're facing a man-made disaster of global scale. Our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Right now, other than Sir David Attenborough, um, the other uh, superhero on this planet, Greta Thunberg, um, has made a very similar plea. Our house is on fire. I am here to say our house is on fire. According to the IPCC, we are less than 12 years away from not being able to undo our mistakes. I think you get the message, and it's the message I come to bring here today as part of the big carbon debate, that regardless what industry you're in, you need to rise to the challenge of making the corrections to mitigate against a, a climate change catastrophe. Uh, Al Gore has been um, uh, pleading with us for many years, and he uses the term using the Earth's atmosphere as an open sewer, which we can no longer continue to do. Because as a result of that, you start to see scenarios like this on the news last summer here in the UK, or this with Storm Dennis and Chiara, or this of today's, I took this off the BBC website on the train up here from London. This is Tuesday night, as in the day before uh, last, and this is a town in the UK which is flooded. Um, or this in Australia, which for the wine world is, is also important because it's a basket of great um, uh, production of wine. And these apocalyptic looking scenes, which are very real. Or this in Indonesia, once again. Or this, um, which we don't see um, as much of. And you can see there the glacier in the early 1900s. Uh, it's no longer there um, today. So yeah, we are treating our uh, planet and we are treating the atmosphere as an open sewer and our planet is deeply unwell. We need to recognize that. 
Um, we, we have to stop um, emitting as much carbon as we do into the atmosphere. We need, and change is happening, fortunately. So, um, like it or not, um, I'd, I'd recommend that you innovate and move with the times because as laws get passed around the world, your businesses will not, uh, not be sustainable if you're not ready to tackle that carbon um, issue. And so I um, recommend that you have the carbon discussion at, at your place of work. You engage with the likes of this great event happening in Glasgow later this year, COP26. Um, you know, very positive to see that at Davos this year, at the World Economic Forum, probably the key issue under discussion was climate change, it was carbon footprint, it was not plastic. Uh, and, and there, once again, a great example of um, industry leaders moving ahead. BlackRock is the biggest asset manager in the world, it's the richest company, to put it in another way. They've made sustainability their standard. They've also started to work out climate risk as an investment risk in their portfolio. Um, that's fundamentally important because big money will go towards the carbon debate and will go towards reducing the carbon footprint. And likewise, Virgin Voyages um, launching carbon neutral uh, cruise liners, um, really important. Fortunately, the UK um, is aware of this, um, so this is a, a, a stat where 9 out of 10 Brits um, see carbon neutrality as their top priority. This is another one from the UK from May 2019, uh, showing the importance of environmental matters occurring also around key events, and you'll probably see this once again if you go for poll again, post these recent uh, bad, bad weather patterns in the UK how we'll see this increasing in importance. Unfortunately, the youngsters uh, are rising to the challenge quicker than most. Uh, tomorrow there is a Friday for Future protest uh, march in Bristol, and Greta Thunberg will be there. Bristol police are concerned of their ability to be able to handle the crowds of such size. This is an example of one in Afghanistan. And actually, if you see those engaging you'll see that um, the graphs no longer work. They spike at such a level that they go out of the picture. Um, these are people attending the Friday for Future marches. These are the number of events on the incline, number of cities, etc. But as you can see here, we start to get to a point of um, many millions of strikers. And countries are also moving ahead in terms of ensuring that we do make this change. Italy was the first country to make climate change uh, lessons at school uh, compulsory. New Zealand and many others are following suit. And you see examples like this, which are really important. Um, you, none of you may be in the, in the aviation industry, but seeing how um, aviation and, and flying has dropped off in Sweden as a result of flight shaming is really important because once that happens in your own companies, in your own industries, you will see a drop. So innovate to uh, ensure that you're not part of the decline, that you're part of the future. Once again, another stat here of consumers wanting sustainable packaging. And change is happening, but it's also happening in a way that potentially, um, you know, you, you, you won't be able to counter it. Um, Chris, Christiana Figueres uh, was the former chief um, uh, at the United Nations uh, on climate. Um, she's calling uh, in February of this year in Forbes for civil disobedience. Um, so this will become more regular as will this, and that is sometimes uh, inevitable as a result of the big issues we have. Now, uh, I came here to share a little bit about the world of wine and the impact of what I've just been sharing before on the world of wine, because wine is a highly sensitive product and it shows what will happen probably to other industries shortly afterwards, because the carbon footprint and the increase of carbon in our atmosphere is reshaping the world of wine. So traditionally, wine grows between these two latitude points, 30 to 50 degrees latitude on either side of the equator. This is the area where Vitis vinifera, the grape variety for wine production, has been planted and has grown successfully. Um, but that's no longer the case. Uh, matters are shifting very quickly. And if you see here, this is a map of areas in the world that are at risk from a wine perspective, a wine growing perspective. Bear in mind, this is really important for communities in countries that have very big 
uh, wine industries. It's not just, don't look at it just as the product you enjoy to drink uh, in your private or social time or, or other network events or whatever, but it's, it's the bread and butter for many communities. It's a really important product. And as you can see here from this stat, it speaks enough for itself. Um, significant change happening. Um, and the wine, world of wine changing significantly. Unfortunately now, the wine world is recognizing that they have an issue with climate change, they have an issue with carbon. This is a study conducted for Pro Wine, which is the world's biggest wine fair occurring in a couple of weeks in Dusseldorf. We will be present um, at that fair as a company. Um, there are, you know, these changes are very evident. So the UK is producing amazing sparkling wines that compete with the French. And actually French companies are prospecting on buying land in southern England in order to give themselves prospects for the future. But that's deeply upsetting if you think there are communities that have subsisted for generations in those appellations. And the fact that the world is changing so rapidly um, will uproot those communities and cause um, a, a big upset. Um, once again, this is a, a northern um, a vineyard in the UK, north of Birmingham, um, traditionally uh, thought impossible for Vitis vinifera, the grape, root, the grape variety, to grow in the north. Or this, actually, one of the world's most famous appellations in the world of wine, Bordeaux production of some of the most expensive and, and, and most special wines. Uh, they changed the laws to allow for different grape varieties to give Bordeaux a better chance of um, survival. Or Sweden, um, so way past the 50 degree latitude point um, and uh, you know, we've got grape, uh, grapes growing there and wine being produced. This is a worse picture. So this is Soda Rock, a well-known wine estate in California. As part of the Kincaid fires, it went up in fire. Uh, or this uh, in, uh, in Australia. These are vines. That's a fireman with a koala next to him, uh, watching the fires coming uh, for the vines and, and for people's uh, existence. This, once again, is because we haven't had enough of a carbon debate before today. So I encourage you, hopefully, to uh, go away and have that conversation. So in wine, we really need to talk about our carbon footprint. We need to do something about it. Um, and there's actually an easy win, and it comes in packaging. So finally, I'll come back to where packaging is relevant for this um, uh, event and for uh, my talk. Because actually, if you look at um, packaging, and if you look at the glass bottle, it's the single biggest contributor to carbon in the world of wine at 29%. This is a study from California looking at a large basket of producers. And if you add the secondary packaging or the transit packaging and the transport, it's more than 50%. So actually, if you want to do something about your carbon footprint in wine, that's where you've got to focus. Another study here by um, the Chilean giant Conchaitoro. Many of you will have drunk their wines in the UK, 42%. Um, or this, um, a third. So, in summary, uh, this is what the round glass bottle uh, is doing to the world of wine. It's contributing uh, disparately and unnecessarily to the carbon footprint. And finally, finally, this past weekend, arguably the world's leading wine expert and wine writer, Jancis Robinson, has started to call out the necessity for us to use glass bottles. Um, and I mentioned um, uh, Sweden's um, flight drop-off and the fact that they call it flickscam or flight shaming, dropping by 9%. Um, Jans has mentioned in her article that Joe Fattorini has brought up the point he's got a Swedish wife and, and said we should probably start in the wine industry calling out for bottle shame to encourage people not to use round glass bottles. Um, and this is another quote, actually. This was a quote written by Andrew Jefford in the Canter when he saw the first prototype of the bottle you see here on this table, which is our product I'll come back to at the very end. Okay, not sure where that came from. Um, so, um, things are changing in wine, fortunately, as, as hopefully you'll have seen. Um, you know, change has been called on by Al Gore for a long time. Last year, Al Gore got involved in the world of wine. It was part of the Porto Protocol, which is one of the leading initiatives in the world of wine to talk about carbon, to have that carbon debate. 
Glass on Wines, my company, is one of the founding members of the organization. And, you know, once again, studies like this showing the impact of lightweighting a wine bottle. So that's an 800 gram bottle and this is a 300 gram bottle. The implications on the 1.4 billion bottles consumed in the UK alone. 284,000 tons of CO2. So coming back to Dancers Robinson again and her plea this weekend in the FT to cut back on glass bottles. Um, she says they should be dispensed with for mass market wines. Um, I agree. Um, I was doing this um, some time ago already, um, but it's great to see leading experts coming out in support of innovation in terms of package innovation to reduce carbon footprint. Uh, same thing with RAP, um, an organization many of you will know working in packaging. Um, they've um, looked for a long time actually at the impact um, of, of carbon on wine and how we can cut carbon emissions. And at this point, the study was not only about lightweighting bottles, but actually about moving liquid and bulk around the world. So here you see examples of all turn to packaging formats, and I don't need to go into too much detail, hopefully, because being the packaging industry will know. But you start to see the difference between glass bottles and, for example, a PET bottle. Same thing if you're comparing PET to can. You can see that at the top level here, can is 331 to 1,300 CO2 equivalents. Uh, PET, uh, 196 to 330, and um, I'm not going to bore you by going to the details, but choosing the appropriate pack is fundamentally important if we're talking about carbon and if we're looking to cut our carbon footprint. Once again here, more studies looking at the alternatives. It's really important to see what is the alternative and in the world of wine, the current dominant primary packaging in wine is a round glass bottle. Um, we think it should be different and I'll come back to what we think it should be shortly. Further data here showing the difference between the different packaging formats and their impact on carbon footprint, um, or this. So yeah, um, uh, I am here from Garçon Wines. I'm here primarily to explain to you about the impacts of carbon on the world, on the world of wine. But to say that in our view, we have a solution. We have a solution that's in a bottle. Now the. The round glass bottle is actually a British invention. This gentleman here, Sir Kenan Digby, invented the glass blowing process in the 17th century that allowed the wine world to have its first wine bottle. And Digby's bottle looked like this. It's, a, it's called an onion wine bottle. But in the, in the 19th century, the French realized that Digby's bottle was great. It was made of glass, but it wasn't so efficient for storage and transportation. So they changed the bottle, and the two key shapes we still use today are 19th century innovations. So there was a shape improvement in the 19th century from Digby's bottle, um, but still around and so lots of lost space. Uh, lighter weight than Digby's bottle for sure. If you pick, we have some of these uh, old bottles in our office, and they're uh, real bodybuilder bottles. But the 19th century wine bottle is no longer fit for purpose in a 21st century world the world of the complexities which I explained before. And so we're introducing what we term to be a 21st century wine bottle. It's a 21st century wine bottle. We're the inventors of the format and we've um, commercialized it over the last 18 months. Um, importantly is that if, if it is to be a product that's to challenge the status quo which is around glass bottle, the product needs to look beautiful because otherwise it's got very little chance in an emotive industry like the wine industry to becoming the dominant primary pack. Importantly, it needs further shape improvement. I showed before how um, uh, the French in the 19th century improved Digby's bottle to save on space. We've gone flat, a cross-section of the round shapes people know and love so that they can pack like books. When you take two circles and you put them next to each other, they just have one contact point. All the other space is lost. When you flatten products, they pack like books. Um, Forbes, uh, late at the end of last year, uh, is one of uh, several writers who have said that the future of wine is flat, referring to our pack. Um, 
So we, we talked, I addressed points before about PT versus glass, and glass is the dominant uh, packaging material in the wine industry. Um, but by changing from glass to PET, we save significant amount of weight. Our bottle weighs 63 grams versus an average 500 gram bottle. And these are the sort of benefits you start to get when you compare PET to glass. Significant carbon savings, savings that you cannot possibly look at when looking at the rest of the items I shared at the beginning of this presentation and say that it's not uh, our responsibility um, to make these sort of savings. In addition, um, we created a bottle in 2018, thanks to our great um, uh, supply partners, Berry m and back then m and Plastics, part of the RPC group, in recycled PET. It was one of the first bottles um, to be entirely made of recycled PET. And this is why we should be using recycled PET, not just because it sounds good, um, because actually these are supplemental savings over the savings I shared before in terms of PET over glass. This is the sort of savings you'd get by using recycled PT over virgin. I hope you agree that they are significant. They're certainly worthy of your consideration. Um, RAP did a, a study looking at migrating bottles and extrapolating their data. This bottle on the table, this bottle on the slide, would save significant carbon per bottle. The UK consumes 1.8 billion bottles of wine a year. The wider world consumes 35 billion. I think if you did the numbers, you'd um, uh, see why it is um, something that we should be doing. So, uh, an improved bottle, a 21st century wine bottle, unlocks benefits in many channels. We talk to companies right across the value chain of wine, looking to implement the pack, whether it's airlines looking for space or, or carbon reduction, uh, others like online, etc. We also showed that through designing the pack smartly, you can pack um, boxes in ways not seen before. This is, a box, this is a case that will normally take four round glass bottles. We pack ten in it because we're packing eight light books. We pack two in the airspace around the, the bottles that are standing upright. We remove pretty much all the airspace from the case. Um, in some instances, we pack up to two and a half times the amount of product on a pallet. Um, once again, cutting costs, but not only environmental costs, financial costs, which is really important for the wine industry, which struggles with margins. And um, uh, some, some sa significant savings there, as you can see, as I was just explaining. So we are used as an example of triple bottom line sustainability, and um, I've spoken mostly about carbon in this talk. I normally talk about sustainability because for me it's important to balance all three whilst recognizing that the healthier planet element of the three pillars, profit, planet and people, is now um, the most important by far. But we must take care of the other two. We can't wipe out industries as a result of solely focusing on this. And Chile was a great example how if you don't take care of society, then society can go down into meltdown. Chile was supposed to host COP25 last year, for those who don't know. And unfortunately, just weeks before they were going to host a climate summit, um, society broke down and went out into revolt, and the climate summit had to be moved to Madrid. That's a great example of how you've got to take care of all three pillars of sustainability. Sustainability that needs to be scalable at size. We're a startup, but we collaborate with giants like Berry m &H and DS Smith for our secondary packaging because that allows us to unlock the scale that can address anyone's needs in the world of wine. Uh, what we're doing and what I've been talking about um, gets its um, fair share of um, praise and awards. Um, we actually were um, recently on ITV um, receiving another award. Um, Here I 
basically talk about the fact we need to be cutting carbon and that's the plea I made because I think it's much bigger than any single company or any single industry. It's about making a general movement and it's my responsibility to take the chance I get amongst talking to these great publications and audiences like yourself to say that it's no longer business as usual, it's business unusual, it's planet unusual and we need to rise to challenge. You know, Words like this given about us, one, another uh, major wine writer saying we give him hope with our pack. Um, or David Luttenberger, um, packaging head from Intel, um, calling us this or this. Or Jancis Robinson referring us to a groundbreaking bottle. So uh, I hope we will have a sustainable future in wine. I hope we'll have a sustainable future in packaging. I hope we'll have a sustainable future as societies, and that's more important ultimately. We're all working hard to live uh, good lives, uh, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, if you think changing the wine bottle is crazy, uh, Steve Jobs will answer that question for me. Um, thank you very much.